then the other event that happened that summer is I got a grant for teaching with technology in my university. And I got a real spiffy laptop computer and all kinds of equipment. And my proposal was to take the rhetoric resources that I had compiled over the years and make them available on the web. And my primary target audience for that was guess who? Well, my students would have to be my primary target audience, I suppose. But I really had classical educators in mind when I made it all available. I put everything I could on the web and I linked it to every place that I thought that could be helpful to people trying to wrap their minds around what this thing is and to break it down for their children and their students. So for two years I've been tweaking this website, trying to make it as practically useful as I can, and promoting it as much as I could stomach on the stern list. I'm not, you know, if I were a self-promoter I'd be a consultant, but I'm a teacher, so I'm not much into self-promotion. But I, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to show you what I've made available to you and hopefully try to elicit some interest in utilizing the helps that are available because the study of rhetoric is really, you know, in, in the medieval liberal arts education, the professor of rhetoric was a person of stature. The person who taught that discipline was considered a person who was well, well versed in humanity in general and really had a grasp on the equipment that a person needed to have in order to be fully human. And I want to try to, um, I think that I have always taught from a traditional liberal arts point of view. In fact, I've had professors comment before that uh, I have the most purely liberal arts approach to teaching communication that they've ever seen. And uh, that's how I, I really, when I started reading some of Dr. Heath's work on liberal arts education and then the things he was publishing in the, for the light of the world really spoke to me. So I connected with him and immediately he invited me to come out and, and work with the folks at the CCLE. And I really feel at home here, but I, I feel like this resource that I've made available has been underutilized up to this point. So hopefully we'll be able to identify some areas of need in your education, in, in your attempts at educating, in your pedagogy, excuse me. And, uh, We'll see where it goes from there. So I'm not going to give a real uh, polished PowerPoint dog and pony show. I did that last year. And in fact, I'm going to begin well into my PowerPoint. I have a lot of stuff earlier in this PowerPoint about the traditional classical liberal arts the trivium and quadrivium and the role of rhetoric within the trivium and I talked about Dorothy Sayers and, and all of that but I'm going to begin a little bit downstream from there and then what I'd like to do is just take you on a tour of the rhetoric ring as I call it. Okay? Alright, so but before I do that, I, I do want to give, for people that aren't real familiar with rhetoric, how many would you, of you would say that uh, you really need to bone up on rhetoric? Raise your hand. Okay. This part is for you. All right? Okay. Techne is the Greek word for art. And the best... But now all of this is online too. In fact, this PowerPoint is online, so hopefully you won't have to fuss with all the really long quotations. There aren't too many left in what I have to remain here, but 
This quotation comes from Back to the Rough Ground, Joseph Dunn, University of Notre Dame Press. And Back to the Rough Ground is a philosophical analysis of the relationship between phronesis and techne. Phronesis is practical wisdom or prudence, and techne is art or craft knowledge. And the idea is, He's trying to make an argument for the value of moving beyond a rationalistic approach to knowledge, which is helpful on the smooth plane or in the speculative arena, but it's not very helpful in the rough ground where we all live and we have to negotiate the bumps and the turns. And phronesis is the, the ability to operate well in the practical arena where things get messy. Okay. But techne he defines as the kind of knowledge possessed by an expert maker. It gives him a clear conception of the why and wherefore, the how and the with what of the making process, and enables him to the capacity to offer a rational account of it, to preside over his activity with secure mastery. I think that's a really fine definition because it speaks to the value in liberal arts education. If you want to grasp a body of knowledge as an art, you have to have a theoretical grasp of it. There is no substitute for theory when you're attempting to master an art. And once you do have the, the theoretical account, the ability to, to provide a rational account, not only of how and what you do, what you're trying to produce or craft, but you can explain the why and the wherefore, then that gives you secure mastery over the art. Okay? And so I try to teach my students that uh, as I study Aristotle, I hope I'm not guilty of having too much Aristotle here today, Professor Pop. As I study Aristotle, I start to notice that he has a, mod a, a, a modus operandi where whenever he's approaching any treatise on any given subject, he first of all will define it, then he breaks it into parts, and then he will have a discussion of the various parts in order to show the relationships, how this part is like that part, genus, how this part is differentiated from this part, differentia, and then he integrates it to show how the parts all work together. And, and that's the process of, of gaining a theoretical foundation in the body of knowledge that you're attempting to study. And then as you practice, and practice and practice what happens. You no longer have to consciously reflect on the body of knowledge you're trying to master. It becomes what? Second nature. Habit. Texas. Habit or habit. You become habituated to think quickly on your feet. The, the art that I attempt to impart to my students, the art of reasoning well, thinking quickly on your feet, articulating yourself, refutation, declamation. Okay. All right. So, rhetoric is a technique. But, as Dorothy Sayers so brilliantly pointed out, as a trivium, it's more than merely technique. It's more than merely craft knowledge. Rhetoric has, is a very multifaceted concept. And there is a faculty of reasoning that's inherent in rhetoric that enables one, for example, 
I think I have this later, or I might have skipped it. Aristotle defines rhetoric as the faculty or dunamis, the power of discovering in any given case the available means of persuasion. He defines rhetoric as the faculty of discovering in any given case the available means of persuasion. So that, that definition presupposes that there is a, a reasoning faculty, an ability that one cultivates to be able to discern the occasion, analyze the audience, pull from their storehouse of lines of arguments, or enthemies, as he called them, pull together the materials that will most, uh, most readily lead to successful persuasion given the audience at hand. So that's kind of that's kind of implied in that definition of rhetoric. So it's more than just learning a bunch of knowledge about a subject matter that has to do with the persuasive arts. It has to do with tools for learning how to argue, how to respond, and how to pick apart an argument, but also how to think quickly on one's feet and how to make judgments and how to make good judgments in the practical arena. So the relationship between pronesis or practical wisdom and rhetoric is very, very critical as well. Yes, sir. May we ask questions? Absolutely. Uh, this sounds an awful lot like Wall Street. Yeah. Okay. Uh, is this plot? I, I don't know anything about Wall Street. No. As far as I know, they don't teach this in law school anymore. However, I have had students who have taken my argumentation class and gone on to take their LSATs and said that it equipped them perfectly to do well on their LSAT. And because it, uh, it teaches, it imparts the kind of habit of reasoning that they test you for on the LSAT. When you get to law school, they teach you argumentation by having mock courts, throwing you in, you study the law, and then you have mock court situations. It's kind of like throwing kids in the deep end to teach them. But in the traditional liberal arts education, students were exposed to all of this, and they were allowed to practice. And by the way, when they were in the PERT stage, I loved hearing that this morning. Who brought that up? The, the PERT stage, the PERT stage, and the poetic stage. While they're still in the pert dialectical stage of education, the students were not allowed to engage in argument with their professors. They were supposed to just sit there and take notes and learn. One of the benefits of entering into the rhetoric phase is they were allowed to engage in disputations. Okay, so another, that's, that's rhetoric, <coughs> That's kind of the threshold understanding of rhetoric. Another way to look at rhetoric from another point of view that I really appreciate comes from Richard M. Weaver. Richard M. Weaver was one of my heroes. He, he was a professor at the University of Chicago, and he wrote a very helpful book. If you're teaching rhetoric, you should check out Richard Weaver's Rhetoric and Handbook. I have one of his chapters online, and I have a tutorial based on that chapter that I presented online. But um, he had some very, very good books. Through the Intercollegiate Studies Institute, I think you can buy three of his books. Ideas Have Consequences. You've heard of that, right? That's, that's in Primus's, uh motto, because ideas have consequences. But Richard Weaver's book was really seminal. Um, the Ethics of Rhetoric and um, 
visions of order, the cultural crisis of our time. Those are all available to you. Intercollegiate Studies Institute. Richard Weaver taught that um, rhetoric was considered the most humane and humane. Aristotle, when he, after he uh, defines rhetoric, he breaks it down into its relationship to dialectic and ethics. Aristotle says that rhetoric is a counterpart of dialectic. And by that he means this, they are both tools that have no subject matter of, them, of their own. And they are useful in the contingent realm where arguments need to be made about the truth of a matter where the truth is debatable. He used dialectic as a test for truth for propositions that are debatable. Rhetoric is also useful once you decide the truth of those propositions, rhetoric is used to convey that truth. Okay? And he also said that rhetoric and ethics hold a lot in common. You ought not persuade people about that which is false. In other words, if rhetoric is the faculty of discovering in any given case the available means of persuasion, there are some means of persuasion that are unavailable to the ethical practitioner of rhetoric, the rhetor. Correct? That's implied in his definition. And so truth-telling is one of the fundamental ethical presuppositions of, uh, of, a, of good rhetoric. But Aristotle, when he talked of ethics, he was really talking more about psychology. He, he uh, maintained that you have to understand something about what makes people tick in order to make good arguments. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, serve one well to present one's arguments in the same way with a young high school audience as with an elderly audience, right? And so you need to know a little bit about the difference between what appeals to young people and what appeals to the elderly. And you need to know, and, and if you're going to rightly relate to your audience, you need to know something about uh, the emotions how to, if, if you're going to move people, the end of persuasion is action. And the ideal is to be able to move people to action, to move the soul. And in order to move the soul, you have to study the soul. I think that's well put an opportunity to that. And so uh, rhetoric has been variously considered the queen of the liberal arts and the harlot of the arts, depending on uh, how it's viewed at any given time. But a lot of the reason rhetoric is, is considered a pejorative in, in some eras, in some epics, has to do with its guilt by association with politics. It's bombast. It's the kind of junk politicians say to get elected. Okay. However, the strong relationship between deliberating courses of action, as as they do in the uh, in the halls of Congress, and the value of, of rhetorical skill in that venue is undeniable. Okay. If it hadn't been for the law schools in the Roman era, rhetoric probably would have died. In the Roman era, the study of rhetoric was kept alive in the, in, when they were teaching people to argue their cases in court of law. Rhetoric and poetics are strongly related. Painting vivid images, 
if you want to move somebody, you have to appeal to their imagination. Repeat the imagination, which stirs the emotions, which moves the will. The more vivid the mental images are, the more masterful you are at painting those images, the better uh, you will be at, at this craft. In the Middle Ages, uh, rhetoric would probably likely have died in the Western tradition if it hadn't been for the seminary. Homiletic was essentially taught with the Greek and Roman uh, rhetorical model. And any, any given argument will benefit from having some sort of historicity to it. If you just try to make abstract arguments without any uh, example or time or any, any historical uh, illustrations, they're pretty meaningless, right? Okay, so in one way or another, rhetoric benefits from a relationship with or it benefits the art or, or the humanity. And so in that sense, as we were pointing out, rhetoric was considered the most humane of the humanities, the cornerstone of the liberal arts education. I did not stick with that. Okay, so there's a little repetition for me. Okay. Now what I wanted to do just briefly is give you a little primer on Aristotle's rhetoric, and I will just gloss over this very quickly. Aristotle defines it, and then he breaks it into parts, and then he elaborates on the parts for his students. When he first divides rhetoric, he makes a distinction between artistic and inartistic proofs. Rhetoric is about making persuasive arguments. Arguments utilize proofs. Some proofs are artistic, which is to say they are crafted by the art, by the technique, by means of technique. Other proofs are simply used, like testimony of others, physical evidence, and so forth. Got it? The artistic proofs are ethos, pathos, and motive. Have you heard of that before? This is still a fairly common construct out of Aristotelian rhetoric. Basically, Aristotle is trying to convey that he, Aristotle asked himself, how is it that human beings persuade one another? And he was kind of trying to ferret out what all the necessary requirements would be in order to have fertile ground for persuading human beings. And he decided that logos is obviously a, a fundamental requirement. Logos, word, logic, good reasons. Why would I be persuaded if you don't give me good reasons? Pathos, or ethos, has to do with the character of the person that is constructed by the event. I present myself in a certain way, and if you perceive me as credible and a person of goodwill, I would not blow smoke. I'm, I'm telling you the truth to the best of my ability. I have some intellectual integrity, and I know how to emote that. <coughs> then you'll likely be persuaded by me, and vice versa. A good audience would not be persuaded by a charlatan or someone given to excess. A corrupt audience would, though, and that's, uh, we could get into that. That's a very interesting commentary on uh, the ebb and flow of morality in society, what people appeal to, mass appeal. But then pathos, this is one reason I really like Aristotle, because he uh, approached rhetoric in, in terms of the whole being. 
that human beings are not just logic machines. We have passion, and it brings the, the head and the heart together. That we need to, in order to move the soul, you have to appeal to the emotions. And that there are right ways and wrong ways. You know, we had guidelines for uh, the the overboard appeal to emotion is not very persuasive for you have to. That's where uh, perspicuity and measure and balance all come together. Okay. All right. Then Aristotle, that, that was one approach to rhetoric. Then he took another approach and he broke, he divided it again on the basis of the nature of the audience. First, there are three necessary modes of proof crafted by the art of rhetoric, but there are also three species of rhetoric that you can discern on the basis of the audience. And the three venues for rhetoric in his day were the assembly in ceremonial speaking or in the contest, the oratorical contest, and before the bar. So you end up with forensic rhetoric, deliberative rhetoric, and epidite. Forensic is legal rhetoric, arguing one's case, and then deliberative is arguing one's case in a policy question before the assembly. And epidite is ceremonial. Okay, excuse me for not elaborating much here, but these are all concepts that as you flesh them out, it really, you can tie them all to uh, the human condition and gaining skill, for example, in arguing one's case in court of law presupposes that you have the ability to get reason your way down to the nub of the issue because the most persuasive argument is going to be that which most clearly addresses the nub of the issue or the question at stake. And so the ability to do that with precision and quickly, to think quickly on your feet, is really a, a good skill to develop. And that's trivial. It's not trivial. That's knowledge that Dorothy Sayers was trying to convey in her article when she talked about Giving my tools for learning. That's not subject matter. Okay. <coughs> then, so forth. The next thing Aristotle does in his treatise on rhetoric is he talks about the topoi. Topoi is plural for topus, which means place or region. Think of a topographical map. The concept was that if you can equip your students with <laughs> regions in the mind that are well supplied with arguments where they can go and draw material with which to craft arguments, then they will have a uh, fine-tuned and um, useful faculty of reasoning and argument. Okay? And then he broke topoi to into common and special topics. This is actually very interesting and it's one of the springboards that I use in my argumentation class to get people to think about the difference between general reasoning processes. Common topics resemble general reasoning processes that are useful across discipline. Cause and effect. Genus or definition. Similitude. When I make a, an analogy, and when I make an argument that's based on an analogy, I'm utilizing reasoning by similitude. I'm comparing things. And uh, when I make a causal argument, 
I'm assuming a cause and effect relationship between the, th the things that I'm uh, asserting that this cause and effect relationship exists. That becomes useful when you are attempting to teach people how to debate, for example. All your debaters at Shepherd of the, Shepherd of the Hill uh, of the Spring should, should know about this because it will help them think in terms of repeating. If somebody makes a false analogy, they'll be able to quickly and with precision say, wait a minute, that's comparing apples to oranges. Knowing these things helps a person develop quick wit. Okay, so Aristotle's aim, aim for his treatise on rhetoric was that his students gain skill and influence. Enthymemes are rhetorical syllogisms. I'm not going to get into that. Visit the web page. <laughs> okay. That his students have a well-supplied storehouse of materials with which to build persuasive arguments. There's a there's the address for you. Can everyone can everyone read that? I'm playing with that idea of, of a storehouse full of material. Picture yourself coming into the Menards. Is it everybody want Menards? Or the Builders Emporium. And it's just stacked walls at least as high as this, stacked high with various material. And then off in the corner, you have the lighting section, and it's beautiful. You have chandeliers and beautiful fixtures, and, and it's all gold and silver and shiny. And so you, you don't just go through there and start filling your cart willy-nilly. You have a plan in mind, you have a blueprint, and you gather the materials that will suit your purposes best, but you don't just stop with a functional structure. You want to take a stop back there to the pretty. And you want to get some nice pictures. And you want to have something that is a thing of beauty. I'll get back to that in just a moment. Did everyone get the address? I don't know how to go back, sorry. <laughs> Can you go back in PowerPoint? Okay, what do I do? Use the arrow. <laughs> I learned something. You were too busy watching that little guy saw. <laughs> Should have been writing. Okay? All right. Now, after Aristotle, in the Roman era, they then broke rhetoric down into the five classical and became canonized. They, became, they, they didn't add a lot of new knowledge, but they took what had kind of been percolating and by the Roman era they had they had codified the seven classical liberal arts and they also had codified these five classical canons of, I said canons, I mean codified. And what they were doing is they were trying to break the techne of rhetoric into five sub arts invention, disposition, style, memory, and delivery. I have it. That was a fancy font, a script font. But anyway, just real briefly, don't try to write this all down because it, it just, you know, it's online and I have it all there. In fact, I'll show you where I have it all broken down. Um, invention has to do with coming up with the arguments that you want to uh, weave together into your speech. You invent them in the sense of craft. They're artistic proofs. They're invented by means of the technique. 
then this disposition is arrangement. That's where you come up with a blueprint style. Once you have your functional elements all in place for your speech, then you have to try to think, or your paper, you have to try to think, where is emphasis needed? Where do I need that beautiful illusion that will evoke an image in my audience's mind that will make the idea explode for them? The meaning will be important. And then memory and delivery, they're the last lost canon and rhetoric. They essentially have to do with memorizing your points so the speech flows well. And uh, delivery is gestures, voice, rate, pitch, all of that. Okay. So the bottom line is rhetoric had stature, the stature that it did in the traditional liberal arts education because it was involved very much in the question, what knowledge must I have in order to be fully human? Human excellence. Human excellence was seen in, in the Greek world in terms of cultivating our intellectual abilities to reason and articulate ourselves, be at home in the realm of ideas. So rhetoric is very much wrapped up in that. Rhetoric is also closely tied to ethics. That's my specialty, as a matter of fact. Um, I'm really interested in teaching groups of people to reason rhetorically together in ethical dilemmas. The resolution of ethical dilemmas like the medical ethics, for example. How is it that groups of people get together and decide what is, by, by pooling their wisdom, what is the right thing to do or the right thing is debatable? So there's a long history of the relationship of rhetoric and ethics. Pronasis in rhetorical reasoning in particular, I find very uh, engaging. And that would be for this reason. If you think about a medical ethics committee, think about the kind of arguments that are brought to bear in order to make the case for what is the right thing to do when the right thing is available. What does that depend on? Experience, knowledge of the law, general knowledge, some scientific reasoning, right? But you can't reason scientifically only in that arena and come up with the right thing. It's not like you could put in uh, some figures into a calculator and come up with the right thing to do. In the legal arena, that's called slot machine justice. But there are always exceptions to the rule. So pronasis is the ability to reason well in that fuzzy area. Okay? All right, and then rhetoric and dialectic are intricately bound, with, bound up with one another. Dialectical inference is a very big part of rhetorical reasoning and uh, Dialectic and rhetoric operate together in the same realm in the practical arena. Dialectic and syllogistic logic, for for uh, just for your information, dialectic and syllogisms are related in this way. They both utilize formal reasoning process and deduction, but syllogisms operate in the, oh, what, I can't remember the word I was going to use. You can express this several different ways, but um, syllogistic logic is demonstrative reasoning. And it has to do with mathematical or logical necessity. Okay? But dialectic utilizes formal logic in questions that are debatable. They're not amenable to that kind of demonstrative truth. You cannot say what is the right thing to do in a moral dilemma like you can say four is the right answer to the equation two plus two. Okay, I'll move on. And I think that's very interesting. And it's very humanizing, and high schoolers love this stuff. 
okay, they're perfectly suited to learn these types of skills and it keeps them very engaged. Okay, and imagination, I think that's said in my book. So it's not mere technique. Classical rhetoric in its most ethical and ancient manifestation is a way of discussing the truth of one's fellows in a manner that respects their freedom and dignity and attempts to move them toward the good. Inspire people to build something that's not just functional, 
most people that teach speech communication in public schools teach a very process-oriented, nuts and bolts kind of thing. If you have a public high school speech coach, you know what I'm talking about. This is a traditional liberal arts approach to teaching, and it's supposed to inspire people to think great thoughts and build something that's got a lot of aesthetic appeal to it. <clears throat> now, right here is your link. Helps for classical education. I've got an 
internet fundamentals of speech class that is classically grounded. Absolutely. All this stuff I've just been showing you is on there. And I had a class of high school kids, 10 high school kids that took it for advanced, uh, their advanced speech class and took it for college credit. Got a lot out of it. They really enjoyed it. They were in a small town, South Dakota, uh, public school, you know. But they really, really enjoyed it. And they enjoyed it so much for the final assignment, I told them I wanted them to go to a war rally and analyze the speech they were doing. I wanted them to experience somebody doing this number. And these kids were way out in the middle of nowhere and they said, we have to probably drive 200 miles to go to a, a, a pro-America rally. Huh. And so I said, okay, we'll just have your own through your high school. So they got all excited. They sent me a video tape of these people. They really did some good things. But this tutorial I just did this year to help teach syllogistic logic, a little bit of dialectic, and um, a lot of rhetoric. And it's got discussion posts, links to other pages, chat sessions were involved in it, and worksheets. So it's right there. I called my um, continuing education people at Dickinson State University, and I told them about the success that I had had teaching those 10 high school students in North South Dakota. And I said, I've got at least three Lutheran high schools present here that may find something like this valuable. I think it's the best of both worlds because you have a teacher there to facilitate and to break down the concept and you have a ready audience and you've got uh, this little short squatty professor up in North Dakota shooting instruction your way nonstop. So they said, by all means, make an invitation. If you find that to be an interesting proposition, we could. Uh, your students could sign up, get college credit for it. Most colleges accept uh, that fundamentals of speaking as one of their gen ed requirements. So, might be an interesting approach for both homeschoolers and for both of us. Well, that's really an extended commercial, and I apologize for that, but I hope you see my motive for doing so. I didn't want to just come and do another dog and pony show. Uh, and I just talked right through the questions, although we have more time for questions than most of the speakers have been allowed today. So, uh, can I? Yes, Dr. D. So you give us the website for the Emporium. Is the website for the Rivery Green? Is that Okay, when you go on the web, the whole address is the same, except the page is ring.htm. So it's jtolman slash ring.htm. Is there anybody who is uh, struggling with any particular facet of teaching rhetoric? Or, you know, the last time I, I did this, there weren't a lot of people that were at that phase yet. Do you want to know any uh, particulars about what I do in my argumentation class, for example. Maybe you'd like to teach your debaters how to debate classically. I can give you a quick thumbnail, Erica. I start by introducing them to basic logic, and I call it boot camp of the mind. And all this is explained on that website. I call it boot camp of the mind. I give them a certificate with a designation. The capstone exercise for that is, I point into the great books of the Western world, Syntopicon, and I say, go get an idea, and give us a philosophical reflection on that. And they give a speech, and I do that whole thing to introduce to them, it's almost like that serves as a foil, because then 
I, I juxtaposed speculative, abstracted argument and case-based argument, which is report uh, syllogistic reasoning or demonstrative reasoning versus practical reasoning in the rhetorical arena. And then the whole rest of the course, I break out on Aristotelian lines. Forensic argumentation, capstone assignment, go look at a First Amendment case and analyze your favorite piece of argumentation. So they write me a paper uh, where they do a rhetorical analysis of the Supreme Court opinion. <clears throat> then the next unit is uh, on moral argumentation. I teach them about casuistry, which is a method of, of uh, resolving moral dilemmas. I have a whole bunch on my website about that. That's what I wrote my PhD dissertation on. But uh, I teach them about casuistry, and then I give them the Jehovah's Witness and blood transfusion case. We do a mock ethics committee meeting. We analyze it, we talk about it, and then they have to, I give them a prompt and I say, okay, you're an ethics consultant for this hospital. They've asked you to render a judgment in four to five pages, identify the crux of the matter, render your judgment, and then defend your judgment. Hence, moral argumentation. Very real world approach from a very classical perspective. Thank you very much. Then the last, the, the concluding assignment is uh, deliberative rhetoric. I don't do anything on epidemic because that's a class in itself. The, the, the deliberative rhetoric is straight up policy debating. We, we pick a policy topic and debate it. Okay, that's the whole class. And all along the way, I'm teaching them rhetorical theory to equip them for upcoming assignments. Dr. Just
face in you know, the topic of history, or if it's a theology class, you're learning to express yourself using uh, the things of rendering. So it really is uh, uh, something that you can do in a lot of different ways. Uh, I don't know if you, if you had any experience you know, with the writing class. It's kind of daunting uh, for us, but I can see how it can really be effective. Well, that's what Richard Weaver's rhetoric handbook was in the text for teaching composition. I tried to shy away from that. That's one reason I went to teach. I'm not put together like Eric at all. I did not plow through a stack of paper several times this <laughs> But I can share great speeches and I can never <laughs> orally and give, you know, off the cuff and that sort of thing, but uh, I think that um, in all of my upper division classes, I include as many writing assignments as I do, but uh, those are usually think pieces of them. In the uh, and I the casualistic case analysis that they do is the closest I get to it. And I'll do it. Okay, anybody else? Any uh, any teachers that have a okay, well thank you very much. Thank you.